Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at the last major type of filter implementation that is easily available to both hobbyists and professionals. What I'm talking about is PCB based filters. Structures built onto or inside of printed circuit boards with the purpose of filtering, usually used at relatively high frequencies when the traces behave like transmission lines. Now in just a moment we'll be checking out both of these examples that I have from today's sponsor, JLC PCB. These are a couple interdigital filters built on FR4 and on PTFE Teflon, but before doing that it's important to understand why someone would choose to build a filter like this. I mean when you're working with hundreds of megahertz or in the gigahertz range, you have the option of the cavity filter or various crystal based filters like saw filters. So let's first look at why would you go with PCB based filters. Well these fall into the distributed element filter category and there are a few common implementations. So you have things like the stub filter, the stepped impedance filters, interdigital and comb line filters, edge coupled filters and parallel coupled filters. These are not all of the filter types of course but rather the main representatives. Based on their construction, these filters can have different response types and transmission characteristics and even though some of these filters can be built in other ways, like the interdigital and comb line filters can be built as cavity filters, and while the stub and stepped impedance filters can be made from pieces of coax or other transmission lines, but things like the edge coupled and the parallel coupled filters can be quite difficult to construct without a PCB. Now, Another important feature of PCB based structures is the freedom to easily make any transmission line impedance, within a certain range of course. So while with the various types of coax available, you're usually limited to 50, 75 and 93 ohms, with a circuit board you can cover a very wide range based on the exact constructive geometry and there are no specific steps in between. Another benefit is that unlike air, a PCB has a higher than one dielectric constant, which allows the filter to be made smaller than the equivalent cavity filter since the exact wavelength will be smaller than the wavelength in a vacuum. So your filter size will be highly impacted by the exact dielectric constant of the board. The larger the constant, the smaller the filter can be built. And well, the last important feature to mention is the possibility of mass production. Once a design is fixed, you can make as many samples as you want with a simple order. So making a PCB based filter seems to be a great option. Well, when something seems to be too good to be true, it usually is. As with anything in this world, although a PCB based filter has major advantages, it does also have a few disadvantages. So the first issue to mention is that the PCB dielectric is not a perfect environment. As with any material that is not a vacuum, there will be some amount of absorption of the electric fields that are occurring around the traces. So there will be a loss associated with the material. Commonly this is documented as the DF or dissipation factor, so higher values means that there is more signal loss and while the exact amount of signal loss is also frequency dependent. So the higher the frequency, the more loss will incur. Another thing to remember is that any manufacturing process has tolerances. So you will have small variations in the mechanical dimensions of your trace, dielectric height and so on, as well as with the exact dielectric constant itself. So typically controlled impedance traces are specified to around 10% tolerance. Another thing to mention is that you will not perfectly achieve the desired behavior. And while unlike a cavity filter, there is no real way to adjust the response after manufacturing. So even if you have a very tight target, in practice, a good design needs to take some margin of error into account to be reliable. And finally, since the filter's behavior is highly dependent, not just on the geometry of the board, but also the surrounding elements, so things like shield boxes, there is a very high chance that the design will not work perfectly the first time around. So unless you have some very good simulation software, do expect two or three iterations until your final design works exactly as intended. 
taking into consideration these aspects, I decided to try and test out such a filter. I mean, how hard can it be to actually make one? To start things off, I used the online microstrip filter design tool from Marky Microwave to determine the exact dimensions for a fifth order Butterworth interdigital type bandpass filter, which is centered around the ADSB band at 1090 MHz. So, to cover any design errors and tolerances, I set the bandpass to be about 20 MHz. So, going from 1080 MHz up to 1100. In hindsight, however, this may have been a bit too ambitious. Anyway, after setting in the input and output impedances, the substrate parameters, like the dielectric constant, dielectric height, and conductor thickness, after you hit compute, you get a nice picture of what the filter should look like, as well as all of the dimensions for the various elements. However, at the time when I first extracted these dimensions, I did not notice that the exact response graph that is also generated is a bit off. So the graph is not centered around 1.09 GHz, but rather around 1.12 GHz or something. So once the board is built, the filter may be a bit off. Anyway, after the design files were done, I hopped onto today's sponsor, JLC PCB's website, and proceeded to order the boards. So you get this nice interface, into which you just need to add the Gerber files, so as a basic zip file, and once this is loaded, you get a picture of what the boards look like, and this also sets the number of layers, as well as the dimensions. And from here, you just need to select your exact preferences for the board, so things like changing the color and any other settings that you have in mind. But other than all of these settings, for today's experiment, I had a few things to keep in mind. First, since I really care about the impedance of the traces, the board thickness and the dielectric constant are critical, since there is a direct link between the exact layout and the board stack when impedance control is needed. For this, there are two important resources that JLCPCB offers. First, we have a general description of how they build their stack up. So this highlights the exact materials and their properties, and all the exact dimensions used for different layer counts and board thicknesses. And the other important tool that is offered is the JLC impedance calculator. So here you can also select two layer boards, choose between one of the thicknesses that they offer, and then select the exact impedance that you want. And one of the important things that you will get out of this is the exact thickness of the two-layer board core. So this is where I got my substrate height. And while for the dielectric constant, I just used the core dielectric constant of 4.6. And while since this is a two-layer board only, with dimensions smaller than 10 by 10 centimeters, you can get this for $2 so 1.8 euros. Now, other than the standard FR4 PCB, I also wanted to try something a bit different. The main advantage of the FR4 substrate is the price. The main disadvantage is the relatively high dissipation factor, usually in the 0.015, 0.025 range. PTFE Teflon, on the other hand, is an order of magnitude better. So back to the JLC PCB website, you may have already noticed that they offer multiple types of base material, including low loss Rogers and PTFE Teflon materials, both widely used when higher performance is needed. These are of course more expensive, but in certain applications they will be necessary. So my second filter board is built with PTFE of 0.76 thickness and the chosen material has a dissipation factor of only 0.0016. So just to get a bit of context, this is an order of magnitude better than the FR4 that was used for the other board. So in theory at least, a board built from this material should be far better than one built from FR4. So if you want to try out any of JLC PCB's products, sign up using the link found below in the description and get $80 worth of coupons for the various products that they offer. Now, after the boards arrived, not much assembly will be needed. So other than the board, I'll only be adding in these SMA connectors. 
and I will place these on the other side of the board, so opposite to where the filter is. And the main reason for doing that is that on these boards, I also left room for a soldered on shield. So that's why I have this frame going around the filter. And I'll be adding in this a bit later on, but this shield would prevent putting the connectors on this side. So that's why they're going onto the opposite side of the board. Anyway, the main things to check are the exact center frequency, bandwidth, and insertion loss. And to achieve that, I will be using my light VNA. So first things first, are the measurement results for the tested boards anywhere near the calculated center frequency? And well, the short answer is yes. The center frequency for the FR board measured at around 1.01 gigahertz is about 80 megahertz lower than expected. And for the PTFE board, we are a bit closer at 1.06 gigahertz. So only 30 megahertz lower. Now, at the same time, looking at the two measurements, we can already observe the impact of the board material. The insertion loss for the FR4 is about minus 9.5 decibels, whereas for the PTFE, it's only minus 4.8 decibels. So the filters do work, but they are a bit off. Anyway, next thing to test was adding the shielding case. So I bought one of these small standard shielding boxes, and to start things off, I only held it in place by hand. And at a later time, I will solder them on permanently. Now, personally, I expected the shielding case to drive the center frequency lower because it would be adding capacitance. But in practice, the observed center frequency, both for the FR4 and the PTFE, the frequency went higher. So the difference compared to the target value has decreased. And at the same time, the bandwidth became a bit narrower, and while well, the insertion loss also increased. Now, I tried adding in a bit of copper tape to increase the conductivity of the shield to see if that was the issue that was causing the increased losses, but I didn't really notice any sort of difference between these two shields. So I left the shield as is. Regardless, with the setup, the difference between the FR4 board and the PTFE has become a bit more significant. So now the insertion loss values are minus 17.2 decibels and minus 7.6. Now, the last thing to do was to try and fix the center frequency. And fortunately, the measured value was lower than the target. So the correction can be done by cutting the resonators a bit shorter. So based on the initial lengths and measured frequencies, I calculated new lengths, which would be equivalent to the target frequency. And in both cases, I got a delta of about 1 and 2 millimeters. And I took these differences and tried to implement them the best that I could. And well, anyway, after a bit of fine tuning and finally soldering on the shields permanently, these are the two results that I got. So I also recalibrated the VNA, that's why the noise floor looks a bit better. But in both cases, I got the center frequency more or less into the place where I wanted it to be. So very close to the 1.09 gigahertz target. Now in the end, the final loss of the filter did increase. So the FR4 board got up to minus 19 decibels and while the PTFE to minus 7.6. I guess this is caused by the resonators being slightly offset. But if we ignore the insertion loss, we have a set of really good filters. There's a very clear pass band with a narrow bandwidth and a very steep drop off. Now, while soldering the shield and performing the various measurements, I also noticed an interesting phenomenon. The filter's response seems to change. So one of the phenomena I was not really aware of before making this video is the fact that, especially for the FR4 material, the dielectric constant and the dissipation factor are temperature dependent. However, for PTFE, this is not so much the case. So the last experiment that I did was to measure the filters at room temperature, which is the red trace in these two graphs, and then heat them up using a hot air rework station that yielded the blue trace. And well, there is a very clear difference in behavior. In both cases, the center frequency has moved, 
with the FR4 it went lower as temperature increased, whereas with the PTFE it went higher, but also losses have changed. So in both cases, the losses have increased to a larger extent on the FR4 and to a much smaller extent on the PTFE. So the conclusion to take from this test is that temperature does indeed have an impact on the filter's behavior, and this impact is more severe on the FR4 board compared to the PTFE. So PTFE is not just a less lossy material, but it's also far more temperature stable. Now, the VNA says that the filter is good, but is it really useful? For this, I wanted to try it out with its final intended purpose. So, the main reason for making this filter in the first place was to filter out of band noise when trying to receive an ADSV signal. So, does it help with that? So, to make the issues and well, the benefits more clear, I first put out my antenna as is and wired it up to the spectrum analyzer set the measure between 10 MHz and 1.5 GHz. And while well, looking at the unfiltered input, the ADS-B signal is one of the things which are not really visible in this area, since the signal is not that strong. But there are a lot of things which are very clearly visible. So starting from the FM band around the 100 MHz point and up into the telecommunication GSM bands. Point is that a generic antenna with a bit of cable attached to it will be picking up a lot of unwanted signals. So does the filter help? Well, I wired up the antenna to go through the filter and then connected it directly into the spectrum analyzer. And well, if we look at the results with this setup, well, the plots are completely different. So I left in yellow the reference trace, so the unfiltered signal, and the pink traces are the signal going through the filter. So I have both the plot for the FR4 filter and the PTFE filter. And well, everything except a bit of the FM band has completely disappeared. Now, the 1.09 GHz ADS-B signal is still not really visible, but at least now, it does make sense to try and amplify the filter to improve reception. So amplifying the old unfiltered input would just result in more problems than benefits. Now, I'll be experimenting a bit more with this filter and inform you on the results another time. In the end, the PCB-based filters do work, and you can also see a very clear difference in the exact PCB material that was used. Although FR4 is commonly used in circuits working up to a few gigahertz, at some point, you will be forced to transition to lower loss and more stable, high-performance materials. Now, if I would make another sample version of these filters, I would either keep them as is and just correct the lengths, or also modify the bandwidth and filter order. Going for wider bandwidths will make the distance between elements smaller, and having fewer elements should also contribute to having a bit less loss. But all in all, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.